Coming up on the Mobile Journalism Show. It seemed insane, really, to me, uh, with London being really a global epicentre of great journalism, not to have a meet-up in London. Women face their own internal boundaries and often also uh, workplace external cultural uh, barriers uh, to being early adopters of, of innovative tech. So today's topics include women in Mojo and how to set up your own mobile journalism meetup. Welcome to the Mobile Journalism Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast-moving world of mobile, here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. Hello and thanks for joining me. And just before we get into the nitty and gritty of today's episode, I just wanted to mention that um, I've changed the name of the podcast uh, from the Mobile Content Creators Show to the Mobile Journalism Show. Um, not because I'm excluding anything that isn't journalism, it's just because I had so much feedback from people who use the term mobile journalism as a kind of catch-all phrase. So people were struggling to find the podcast saying that um, they put in that term and it wasn't showing up. So I decided to try out uh, changing the name. So I've changed the name, but it'll be the same content. And don't worry if I will be bringing in guests who are not just from the uh, journalism side of things. Well, I'm joined today by Corinne Podger, who is the founder of the Mojo Meetups in both London and Sydney, because obviously they're very close together, um, and also one of the um, leading Mojo trainers in Australia. So, uh, Corinne, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to speak to me across all the different time zones. Thank you, Mark. Lovely to be with you. And um, so, first of all, probably it's best to give me the little 30-second abridged life history then. Yeah. Okay, well, I started out in newspaper journalism in the 1990s and I moved into radio. Uh, and towards the sort of end of the 2000s, when uh, I was working at the ABC in Melbourne, was really when uh, journalists started to use their phones uh, to produce content. And the, the first cabs off the rank in that regard were radio people. The ABC uh, encouraged journalists to use an app called I Said What to record what we call donuts, which is a piece where a journalist is out and about and you throw to the journalist from the studio and then they speak to someone and uh, then they send the audio back. But you can do those as a pre-recorded style of, of broadcasting. Um, and then I moved to the UK in 2013 to work in the media development sector. I worked a bit with uh, Reuters for about 18 months with their foundation. Uh, and that was training journalists in developing countries. And that was where I co-wrote the first mobile journalism course for Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, and in 2015, I moved to BBC Media Action, which is also working with journalists in developing and emerging economies. And I helped the, the charity there to actually focus inwards on a corporate social media strategy for the charity. And it seemed like a no-brainer to train the staff uh, across the charity on using their mobile phones to collect the content, uh, both audio, visual and photography, uh, so that they would have content to put out on their social platforms. Um, I'm now back in Australia. I've uh, recently been working with Fairfax Media here, which is one of our big publishers, uh, teaching mobile journalism amongst other things. And I'm about to join Maclay College in Melbourne, which is one of the few tertiary institutions in this country to have a formal mobile journalism course for its bachelor and diploma students. It's funny you say that. I mean, the, the, the few courses uh, that offer this, I'm amazed by how few um, academic institutions have, have really got on board. I, I mean, why do you think that is? Why do you think it's, um, it's not already commonplace? Because surely it should be. I wonder whether it is a misnomer. I think that a lot of institutions do teach students to use their mobile phones to collect content, but may not necessarily use the phrase mobile journalism. And I think that this is uh, replicated in the industry, that a lot of journalists are not familiar with uh, the nickname Mojo, which is something that you and I know very well, uh, they're just used to using their phones. The degree to which they do use their phones uh, really depends on their jobs. Uh, it depends on things like union regulations. In other words, if you work for a television station and um, – in other words, if you work for a television station or a newspaper and you pick up your phone and use that to shoot video or, photo or photos, uh, you may be then putting someone else's job at risk if they are a professional camera person or photographer. 
So there are a number of reasons why, I think. But also, I think a lot of young people, uh, on the one hand, produce content every day with their phones in their personal lives. Uh, but when they think about journalism, there is still this feeling that particularly when it comes to visual journalism, that that is photojournalism or working in a TV station. So I, f I feel that there are some cultural shifts that have, have been taking a while to take place in, in not just the sector, but people who want to work in it. And so in a sense, are you sort of thinking that, you know, because people can whip out their phone and shoot stuff, um, that's kind of citizen journalism or just sources? Um, and people separate that from the actual kind of journalism thing where people go into a newsroom and have a morning meeting and that kind of thing. So do you think there's a kind of just a perception difference that your phone is used for one, but not so much for the other? Yes, I think that's part of the problem. But I, I also think it has to do with the ubiquity of mobile phones, uh, that we all have one, or at least, you know, many of us have one. And uh, it's something that we use for a whole range of activities, including personal activities, banking and, you know, booking travel and uh, finding out what's on uh, television tonight. It's not always something that has a very clear work-related role in our lives. So I think that is that is part of the issue. And then there is just the, the glamour, the continued glamour, I think, of television journalism. When I worked in television, if I told people where I worked, there was a certain frisson around that that wasn't quite the same as when I said I worked in radio uh, or newspapers. So I, I do really think this has to do with some of the cultural attitudes with which uh, we regard mobile phones. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I've done a few projects where we bring sort of school children into somewhere like the BBC. And um, when you say, right, today we're going to film on iPhones and iPads and their faces drop because, you know, it's, like, oh, OK, that doesn't, you know, we do that all the time. Uh, but when you sort of put it in an iographer, padcaster, some kind of casing, put a microphone on, maybe a little LED light, suddenly they brighten up again because it looks professional again. So I, I take your point there. Now, the... You've obviously uh, worked in the UK and now you're back in Australia. How, do you see in the kind of industry, is it very different between the two or is it much of a muchness? It is a little bit different. I think one of the things that I've noticed about uh, journalism here in Australia is that uh, the term mobile journalism is not as well known as it is in Europe or North America. There just hasn't been the exposure, I think, to the movement that's given rise to this term. Now, that's not to say that people aren't using their phones for work. So at Fairfax, where I've been working uh, with journalists across the business, particularly in our community and regional papers, it's expected that journalists will uh, use their phones to generate uh, video and audio and edit it quite often on the phones um, for particularly for social platforms but also for their mastheads it's just that they're not often familiar with the phrase mobile journalism I think journalists in the United Kingdom in North America and across Europe do have a particular advantage in that there are regular gatherings of journalists from a multiplicity of media outlets. So, for example, in London, there are the News Rewired conferences, there's the International Journalism Festival in Perugia in Italy, and there are the uh, news summits and newsonomics events. And my, my point in mentioning this is that it gives a lot of reporters a chance to really network and have a cup of coffee or a drink with their peers at other media outlets and just talk to them about the kinds of innovation that are underway um, elsewhere. There haven't been as many of those kinds of events here in Australia. Uh, there is an event that's held once a year here called Storyology, which is an initiative of the Walkley Foundation, uh, but once a year isn't very often. And that's one of the reasons why I felt it would be really useful to set up a Mojo Sydney meetup pretty much as soon as I got here. All right. So we're going to come on to the meetups now. Now, um, you set up the one in London, which I've uh, been to and very successful, um, some great guests. But um, what first of all, what was your motivation for doing it? Why did you think it was necessary? After the first mobile journalism conference organised by RTE in 2015, there was a meetup set up in Dublin and there were a couple that were set up in the north of England. 
it seemed insane really to me uh, with London being really a global epicenter of great journalism, not to have a meetup in London. Uh, and so not seeing anyone else stepping up, I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it. You know, it, it, how complicated can it be? Uh, and it, it turned out not to be that complicated. What was fantastic was that the the network that had formed at MojoCon uh, meant that I was able to put the word out on on the MojoCon Facebook page. Hey guys, I'm I'm interested in doing this. Uh, I initially managed to find a pub that we would be able to hold it in, but Trinity Mirrors Daniel Jackson very quickly stepped up and said, "I think we can get the lecture uh, the lecture theatre on the 21st floor at the Canada Water Building," uh, and that was where it was held from around sort of March 2015 onwards. If somebody else were trying to do the same thing somewhere else, what advice would you give them? What what did you wish you knew? Um, <laughs> what, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? I think it makes a big difference to have a decent venue. I think that was really the most challenging thing was finding a space that combined both uh, the ability to live stream uh, and Wi-Fi access so that we could play samples of uh, work from around the world on YouTube and have people be able to see it on a decent screen with some speakers. So I think it is challenging to do it on one's own unless you already work at, a, at an organisation that has a venue like that. Um, and so I think it's really useful to work out who is in my area. And a great place, obviously, to do that is on the Facebook group MojoCon, um, just ask, hey, I'm in, you know, I'm in uh, Mexico City, I'm in Paris, I'm in Brisbane, I'm in uh, Manchester, I'm wherever. I'd like to start doing this. Is there anyone around? And that's exactly what I did when I set up the, the Sydney one. Um, I put the word out before I left the UK, hey, guys, is anyone interested in running something like this or having something like this in Sydney? Is anyone interested in working with me? So that's the first thing. The second thing is it is quite a challenge to do it all by yourself. Um, I've been very fortunate in that although I got the first two events going on my own, I immediately had interest in assistance uh, from Daniel Jackson, the head of communities at Trinity Mirror. So what I would suggest to people who are planning to start one is if you don't have a network by the time you've organised your first event, use that first event to just get a sense of how much time has everyone got here? Have you got a chance to help me look for speakers or, you know, look for a venue? Is one of us happy to manage the meetup site? And we can talk about that in a moment. But just having someone to um, share the load a little bit with really does make it a lot easier. One of the other things that uh, we did in, in London was be responsive to requests and suggestions from participants. Uh, so we regularly used to gauge, not just via the website, but also at the events, what would you like to hear at these events? One of the things that people particularly wanted was practical, just short practical opportunities to learn, whether it was specific apps that they could use for photography or video or audio, or whether it was particular kinds of kit. So which tripod should I use? What light should I try? Um, you know, what, what kind of microphones are there? And as there isn't really a shop front for a lot of these types of equipment, these meetups were a great chance for people to get their hands on, you know, this microphone and that microphone and actually have a listen to it. Which one's better? Which one's going to work with my phone? For somebody who's never been there, what's, what's the format you chose? Um, how did you choose to sort of structure the evening? What I wanted to do in London was to create an informal space for networking and sharing ideas um, at the same time as not uh, stepping on the turf of uh, people who earn their living from training full time. So I wanted to keep it quite short. Right. So the idea was that we would uh, have people arrive at around 6, 6.30. Uh, there would be a bit of time to just kind of chat and network. We would set the room up so that it wasn't always lecture style theatre uh, theater seating. And we'd have an area at the back with some crisps and orange juice and you know, cups of tea uh, so that people could have a bit of a chat before we started the event. Then we would kick off at 7.00. 
with something that would go for around half an hour followed by half an hour of either discussion or Q&A from the audience. So they get to ask questions of a practitioner. And then we would knock off at, you know, 7.30 sharp, um, and that would be then another hour of literally just hanging out, networking and talking and building contacts. That was a really great way of doing it. It meant that we weren't asking too much of our presenters uh, because we didn't have a budget uh, for paying people and so people were doing this out of the goodness of their own hearts it was an opportunity for them to if they were trainers or they had a business to um, mention it or put up a slide um, and it also wasn't asking too much of our audience you know the people well audience the, the participants that would come along on the night uh, you know they could they could leave at 7 38 o'clock and still have gotten a really great evening or you know they could kick onto the pub and uh you know enjoy sort of socializing with their their newfound buddies um you know late into the evening and and we did have some very late nights in london <laughs> yeah i can vouch for that um and that's a great thing isn't it that people do stay in touch beyond um the meetup and you have those connections where people you maybe have encountered on social media get to meet them face to face or things mm-hmm. that you hadn't really heard of, you know, um, that, you know, opens your mind. And how's the uh, Sydney meetup going? We've had one event, uh, which was in December, and that went really well, actually. Uh, it booked out, uh, which was fantastic. We had journalists from Fairfax, uh, from the ABC, from other media organisations in Sydney. Uh, we had people who were citizen journalists, bloggers. We had people from the private sector and education sector. Uh, and we also just had some people who were interested because they're on Meetup. And, you know, when you're on a Meetup, uh, if, if you belong to the Meetup website, it'll say, oh, you're on this group. You might find that group useful and or interesting. And so... Um, so we had really a, a great mix, actually. Uh, we'll have the second one sometime in, sorry, the, the next one's uh, next week, actually, this coming Tuesday, and another one in February. Another uh, f- question that um, uh, I want to put to you, which is uh, based on an article that you popped up in, um, I think it was in December, um, women in Mojo. Are there enough women involved? Is it that uh, women are in um, involved in great numbers and perhaps aren't getting as much um I don't know, attention as they should do. What's your take on that? I think we need to look at, first of all, the number of people working in journalism. Yep. So in North America and Europe, the gender base, uh, in North America and Europe, the the gender split of who's working in journalism is around half-half. There is slightly more men working in journalism, but not heaps more. Yeah, it's a very different picture in the global south, but if we're talking Western countries, it's a pretty even split. And then if we look at the proportion of people who are being asked to use their phones for their jobs, I'd be very surprised in many newsrooms if that's not close to 100%. Uh, you know, the, the number of times I've heard editors, um, you know, in, in London express a, a level of frustration really that their journalists aren't always taking their phones out of their pockets when they're out on a job um, is pretty high and so that to me says people still aren't really habituated to it if they're not doing it it really doesn't have to do with what gender they are having said all of that sometimes women face their own internal boundaries and often also uh, workplace external cultural uh, barriers uh, to being early adopters of, of innovative tech. That's not to say that there aren't some amazingly talented uh, women in digital innovation, but it has tended to be a bit more of a boys' club. Um, you know, sometimes you are trying to make an inroad into that and not getting the sort of uh, welcoming um, reaction from your colleagues that you might expect or have hoped for and so that that discourages you so there is this it's very difficult to work out you know is is it is it us or or is it them <laughs> who's responsible for this but uh what i would like to say i guess is that if you are in a senior position in a newsroom do make sure that everybody is getting an equal go Uh, that everyone is being encouraged to innovate, that everybody has a a chance to talk about what it is that's holding them up. So you can understand, is it um, an internal barrier or is it in fact something that's a problem with our workplace culture and fix it? Because there are some fantastically innovative 
uh, women working in mobile journalism. Um, you know, Elena Mannion at RTE, uh, Lenore Suarez, uh, you know, working in Spain for the public television broadcaster there. Um, Theatre Alguera, I never pronounce her name correctly, who's, who's just recently set up her own media company. And of course, all, all three of those have exactly. appeared at your uh, meetup, haven't they? Well, yes. And in fact, they, they appeared, I think, back to back. And I think this really illustrates the point. I wasn't looking to um, privilege female speakers. I just was looking for people who were doing innovative work. And these three women came across my radar and I thought, I have got to book them as speakers. Now, maybe I would ask myself or the universe, you know, if I was a, a male, would I have necessarily booked them? Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't, I am a feminist and so I don't, I do really try not to apply any gender bias. And so that does mean that I want more of an even split. I would also mention that the IJNet article, the authors of, of those articles uh, did ask a lot of journalists, a lot of mobile journalists when they were preparing a series because the article that I was quoted in was the sixth after a series of five. Uh, they are sorts of male mojos for recommendations. And what they what they found was that, uh, first of all, a lot of the people who were recommended were other men uh, and a couple of the women that were recommended or approached didn't feel comfortable to speak. I think as a sector this is something that we should be thinking about because the technology is ubiquitous. So it really is down to us to make sure that the practicing of that technology is also ubiquitous and not split down the gender line. It'd be great if somebody could do some research because it's one of the things that I'm often asked, like how many people are doing it? What are the kind of mix of the type of people who are doing it? And, you know, any kind of gender split. Um, and that's one of the things that is often it's kind of a perception. It's very hard to to measure what the um, the reality is. But um, I mean, on the, um, the fact that m mobile is accessible to everybody, I remember working at the BBC and, you know, when the video journalism thing first came out and some of the equipment that, uh, you know, was being handed out with like absolutely humongous tripods um, was just, you know, you had to be a certain physical build to actually operate that way. It was just, you know, really heavy bags, impractical bags, really heavy tripods. I think one of the great things about mobile is it doesn't matter what your stature is. It doesn't matter, you know, anything. It's like everybody has a phone. So it's a, a great leveler. So it would be a shame if it's a great leveler with the technology, but um, in the implementation that uh, equality isn't actually happening. That's absolutely true. So I'm a five foot one woman. I weigh about 52 kilos. That's approximately the weight of some of the analog equipment when I was working in radio. And, um, now, you know, we're talking about um, getting more and more people involved in this. You, you know, you've done the meetups. The, your next step is lecturing. Um, what kind of stuff do you think that uh, you're going to need to teach? What are the, the skills that you see are the um, things that you absolutely have to learn at this point? Well, it's interesting, actually, because the, the approach that I plan to take um, and that my, my co-lecturer up in Sydney takes to mobile journalism is that the thing that uh, makes it mobile is that it is portable. And so one of the things that uh, we will be teaching is the the workflow uh, of recording on your phone and then transferring to edit on, on a, a, a laptop or, uh, you know, or back at the office on a desktop. Because for, for young journalists, they absolutely need to be able to use the phone as a professional piece of kit but they also need to be conversant in the industry standard uh, software programs uh, that are that are you know very common in both newsrooms and in advertising agencies and content marketing agencies and public relations sector and you know all of these sorts of spaces. Uh, they won't be editing this stuff on their phone in those settings. Just uh, wrapping up, you're going to continue to um, do the meetups and uh, will you be over at MojoCon this year? I will be over at MojoCon this year, so uh, I'm delighted that uh, I've been asked to uh, join one of the, the panels. It just happens to be an all-female panel. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you for your time and thank you for covering so many different areas. Um, you know, we've covered everything from um, <clears throat> different industries to meetups to, um, you know, the uh, gender equality within uh, mobile journalism. So I think we put the world to rights in a very short space of time. Um, but um, if somebody wants to connect with you, follow you, um, uh, you maybe get involved in the meetups, uh, where can they find you? The easiest way to find me is on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at and then Corin, that's C-O-R-I-N-N-E underscore Podger, P-O-D-G-E-R. And I have open DMs. So just uh, ping me a DM and let's talk. Great talking to you across all these different time zones. And I look forward to seeing you in person in uh, Galway. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And we'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To get in touch with Mark, go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at Mark Egan Video.